Hi, and welcome to the Spencer Lodge podcast in partnership with Najahi Events. Have you ever had a chance to sit down and learn from Britain's greatest mountaineer? Been to Everest twice, climbed probably more mountains than we could even count. The epic and the incredible Sir Chris Bonington. On today's episode, I talked to Chris about fear, how he handles it, and also, more importantly, how at the age of 85, he still feels as young as he did at 50, and how you should really push forward and live every day and make every day count. So without further ado, let's get stuck in. So Chris Bonington, I had a blooming poster of you on my wall as a 12 year old kid, as this, this guy with this big black beard and big dark hair, kind of wavy dark hair, this kind of real rough and ready alpha male climber adventurer when I was younger. And I used to look at that picture and think, I want to be like that guy one day. And here I am at the age of 49, almost 50, and I get the chance to talk to you. So first of all, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Delight to be here. Now you're here in Dubai, here at this festival, and this is your first time into Dubai, but you've been into the Middle East before, yeah? I've been in the Middle East, well, I've been in Abu Dhabi about 20 years ago, and that was about 10 days. I think I had, it was a, a corporate thing, and I had two kind of presentations a week apart, which was great, and, and it actually really looked after me, and I had lots of trips into the desert, it was brilliant. And then, oh, more recently, when climbing in the Amman, and we had about 10 days climbing in the Amman, which was fabulous. Terrible rock, but fascinating. It's people. very sharp, isn't it? Very sharp and very bad and very, on the whole, very loose. Mm. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I do a mm. bit of hiking here as well. Yeah. Now, you're famous for being a, a mountaineer. We know you've been up to the summit of Everest, and I'm sure you've talked about that a thousand times. What maybe I'd like to talk to you about today is a little bit about fear. Um, and how fear impacts us. I read a book recently by Ant Middleton, who just climbed uh, um, Everest, mm -hmm. and he's from, from the, he was in the special boat services before in the in the UK, and he described it as the as the most dangerous adventure of his life, and he was most frightened. But when we talk, when he talks about fear, he talks about how people become overwhelmed with fear before they even start the the, the, the experience, which is going to be dangerous. Let's say. And he learned how to compartmentalize it. You, you've dealt with very frightening experiences, some that I'm sure that have gone very badly along the way. You've lost friends as well. How do you deal with fear and how have you coped with it over the years? Well, I think firstly, fear is an incredibly important, I wouldn't say it's so much an emotion as a, as, as a signal. And fear says, this is a dangerous situation. Should we be here? And if you climb with someone who is fearless, he's going to get you killed or she's going to get you killed. So firstly, fear, you need to know what fear is. And then you need to know how to handle it. And you, I think it's firstly, you're in a day. And the, no, there's two levels once again, which you touched on. The, the most worrying fear is actually in anticipation. And so I, I, I remember oh, the night and the day before, I made one of my attempts on the North Wall of the Eiger. And, you know, I knew its history. I had experienced some of it myself. And, yeah, I was worried. I was frightened. And uh, then, though, you one just kind of shut that out of your mind because you wanted to do it. You then get onto the climb itself. And then the fear drops away. You're just focused on the climbing itself. And at, if you get into a, a difficult situation, you're so busy actually extricating yourself from that situation. There's no time to be afraid. That's really interesting. You're, you're, you're so focused on what you've got to get done that you don't yeah. get that chance to be like that. Can you remember when you were the most afraid? Was there a time when you literally thought, this is kind of like, it could be my end. It could be my demise. I'd say there were most the... I remember when I started climbing, really right at the beginning of my climbing, back in the 1950s when I was about 17, and I've never been on a climbing course in my life, and so it was all self-taught. 
And I remember there, there were times when, you know, those were the days when you had a hemp rope. Uh, you had practically no protection as such. And you get to a position where you, you couldn't reverse where you were. If you couldn't get back down, you had to keep going. And you go back and you kind of get to the top of this pitch rope length. And a sweat, you know, kind of panting terror, and pounding. And then you, you look, after you've done that two or three times, you began to learn how to avoid that situation or deal with it much more effectively. And I think now, I think no, there's no. If you're in a difficult situation, you just focus on coming through it. And on, a, if you're on, a, particularly on a very, very hard rock climb, and you've got to a point where you certainly can't reverse it. You, um, you're a long, long way from your last protection, your last running belay. So if you do fall off, you're, you're certainly going to hurt yourself very badly or be killed. And you're just totally focused in getting up that climb. And if you're, cli you know, when you're climbing well, you're at the top of your form, there's a, a kind of a, an exhilaration almost in doing that total concentration of each move, working it out and then doing it. And you get to the top of that rope length and you know, um, it's more than exhilaration, it's a euphoria. And you know a euphoria, you've done it and you go, and that, that, is, that is what climbing is all about. Yeah, I would agree with that. Now, when you think about your age that you're at now, you're 85 years old. I watched a video, I watched a video recently with you at the old man of Hoy. That was five years ago. I was 80. Then, you're yeah. 80 years old. Now there's a load of people out there that will have a train of thought which will be, what is a man of 80 years old doing that? He must be mad. But there's a lot of people out there that I find as well that almost when they get into their 50s or maybe the beginning of their 60s, they start to write themselves off as not being able to do things that they could when they were younger. Where do you get the drive and the motivation? Because 60s, 25 years ago for you and, you, and for lots of people, they're considering themselves close to retirement and getting on a bit. Where do you get the motivation to keep pushing through? Well, just because I love it. But I think in my 60s, I was still climbing, climbing well, climbing hard. Um, and it was only really in my 70s that my, my climbing standards started dropping. You were that little bit, you were stiffer, uh, and you hadn't got the same flexibility, you hadn't got the same stamina. And, and then, yeah, I, I noticed that you know, my, my actual lead climbing standard was going down. But, that, that, you know, you, it's not a matter of accepting it, but you just, you keep climbing, but you're climbing at a level that you, you can manage it, but you're still always pushing yourself a bit at the same time. And now, I mean, I've, yeah, I, when I did the Old Man of Hoy when I was 80, I did actually slip a couple of discs and it, it led to, to spinal surgery. And, uh, and I think within that, since I had that surgery, my, my balance has been very poor. And I think there was some serious nerve. Well, I know now. Because I scanned so it. Okay, well, hold on a minute, because this is really relevant to me. What surgery did you have? My, this, was it fusion surgery, or it was uh, the, the the two um, slip discs, and those actually the, there were some nerves trapped. Yeah, and so the surgery was to free free up those. So it was micro surgery, mm -hmm. and it was to free those nerves up, and it, that didn't actually make that much difference. But it just wore off. But after that, and I started noticing that my balance was much poorer, and I, and I have a feeling that maybe some ner nerves were damaged in that process. God, I never, I, you've got no idea how significant that is to me. Mm. In 2012, mm. I had spinal fusion surgery, mm. and the operation failed after six yeah. months, and I had to have it done again. Mm. So similar yeah. in ways that, of yours. And since that second operation, my balance isn't the same as it was. And I, and I didn't think it was the, the surgery because I convinced myself yeah. there was, it was maybe an inbuilt apprehension or fear that I had to doing things that m probably pushed me down to being a bit more cautious. But you could be touching something. No, I think it's, uh, and whether it's, uh, I mean, I, know, I, I end up, because it was getting worse, and I had a, you know, the whole bloody works of, um, 
of scans and the, I mean the yeah, reassuring yeah. thing was that there's nothing wrong in the brain um, but uh, <laughs> can we just <laughs> don't worry the, the, oh there's Loretta yeah right we'd better uh, put this on to airplane <laughs> mode <laughs> There we go. Airplane Chris mode. Bonington on the Spencer Lodd podcast, <laughs> taking calls. <laughs> okay, so just quickly, let's go back to that the thing. You, so you're convinced, you were happy that there was nothing to do with nerve damage to your brain. So that was something that you were sure from the scans That's that didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. And then there, there's no doubt about it, though, that the, I think the, the lack of balance, that, that's almost certainly can is part of it. I'm yeah, so glad you said that's that. What, and my neurologist said that. And he said, well, the thing is, you could have further surgery, but there is a risk in it. And uh, and from what yeah, I've talked to other people, and so I think, no, I'm, I'm, I'll, A, live with that, but at the same time, I think by uh, doing the right kind of physio and the right kind of exercises, you can actually make that a lot better. I think Do you have sciatic pain at all? No, no, no. Oh, so you're not, not that problem. No, so it's, it's just pure, so it's pure balance, but we're still, I mean, we get, we get out walking every day. I was just going to ask you about exercise. How often do you exercise? I mean, you walk every day. Every single day. Do you do stuff yeah. in the gym or do you do no, stuff? I hate gyms. <laughs> and uh, we, go, we go on the climbing wall there because the climbing wall is great You because you, you're going straight up mm -hmm. and down and and climbing is the, it exercises everything up single muscle in your body. Mm -hmm. So we go. We live um, in London. Uh, we've got Westway, which is the just below the Grenfell Tower, in fact, and it's a superb indoor climbing kind of centre. I've heard about that. Uh, absolutely fantastic, huge and lo huge variety of routes and everything else. And we try to get down there a couple of times a week. Oh man! Mm -hmm. So at eighty-five years old, you go out walking every day. You go to a climbing wall twice yeah. a week. You hate gyms like me too. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, it's kind of like you're not connected unless you're in the outdoors, are you? I think. So, when did you, when did you do your last climb? Was it was it when you were eighty? Was that your last proper climb? The last no, the last real yeah. Well, it was actually no. Even after that, um, I but and before it was before basically my. I, the, the real back trouble had got in. I got down, I went climbing with some friends of mine down in the south of Spain. And then, yeah, I did several, you know, quite hard, yeah, seconding, but quite hard, you know, kind of grade five routes. And does a man like you that's so active and uh, of a mind and active physically, do you get frustrated that your body is, is, is getting older and slower bit by bit? Does it Does it make you kind of like, well, to, to a degree, yes, but there's no point in letting that get you down. I mean, I think the you want to live life to the full. I, I think with me, I think um, with my wife, Loretto, she, I mean, we do everything together. And, um, and it's actually sharing a life together and doing things together. She's, she's taken up climbing. and She didn't climb before she was with you? No, no, she, she, she tried it and Mac, um, her deceased husband, was one of my oldest friends, uh, who was a very good climber. And, uh, but she never, she, she always went with him, to, to, but she never actually went climbing. And, then, and she gave it a try on the, the climbing walls. But now where we're at the moment, I basically we just go walking and exploring. What do you, what, let me just talk about this, two important things here. You talked about you love climbing, that's why you do mm. it, okay? And why people don't do what they love is lost mm. on me. But th there's always people that are left behind when we go and do something dangerous. And they have to, they have to cope with other things that we don't necessarily either process or we don't necessarily uh, accept. How, how did you deal with that over the years with, with people you know, worried about you? Well, they, no, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, the, to be, to go on climbing, but to actually not just go on climbing, but to be an extreme climber. And, uh, and also, you know, the, it is highly dangerous. And I've lost all too many friends on expeditions of mine and, and friends who, who've lost their lives, you know, an awful lot of them. Uh, and 
I, th- I suppose it's the strength of your passion for climbing. And yeah, it's selfish, no doubt about that. But I, I couldn't, I wouldn't want to go on without it. Um, and I think uh, my marriage with Wendy, which was 52 years, but she knew she, when we met, I, I, I was, you know, I was on Already. top of my form climbing. So she knew what she was getting in for, going in for. And she, and she was 100% behind me. And I suppose the, the more difficult one, though, is, is your children and when you start having children. And, um, and I think there, it's, well, in a way, you, you're, giving, you've, you're giving them a lot anyway. And I think you're giving them a, a, a lifestyle and um, a role modeling, which actually both, both my two boys have had highly unconventional careers, but they've ended up doing things they love doing. One's entrepreneurial, the other uh, runs a gym in, in Australia and goes trekking and everything else. And they're doing the things they love doing. They've made fantastic marriages, got, got fabulous grandchildren. <laughs> and so, that you know, and I think that the fact that you have led an incredibly fulfilling life yourself, and I think in that time you have been able to give a lot of love, and at the same time as well, when I was at home, because I was self-employed, uh, I saw in some ways a lot more of them than I think the, the modern, hard-working, ambitious executive is probably out of the house at seven o'clock in the morning and gets back at eight o'clock at night, mm-hmm. five days a week. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think my children saw more of me. Because of it. Yeah. Now, you talk about doing what you love and passion, there's the majority of society don't. Mm. They get up every day. That executive's mm. one of them, isn't it? Yeah. They get up every day and, they, and, and a lot of people exist. And for me, doing what I do for a living, it matters to me enormously that people do what they love. What, what do you say to the, the people that are out there that are, that are kind of just existing and just going through the motions of life? Do you, do you have words for them? Do you have advice for well, them? Well, I could do, as Chancellor of uh, Manchester University for 10 years, and, and you have to give the you know the, the graduation speech when you they took all their degrees, I, and I mean I, and I always faced it around uh, actually that you need to find a job that you love doing, and uh, and at times you know finding that job and doing that job, <laughs> there's, whatever you do, there's going to be a hell of a lot of hard work. There's going to be a lot of bits of boring stuff and everything else. But you've got to find something that you that you actually you get out of bed in the morning and you look forward to getting to to whatever you're doing. And if you don't, you really do need to start thinking about should I do something else and have the courage to do it. And uh, and, I, and I think you know you see it's sad to see people who are basically unfulfilled. And they're doing something they downright hate doing. And it'd be so much better to see them actually, yeah, trying to find something that they did love doing. So Chris Bonington, one of my all-time heroes, thank you so much for coming to join me on the well, podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so talk. much. Well, there you have it. Sir Chris Bonington, Britain's greatest mountaineer. What an incredible guy. He's 85 years old. He's still alert and alive. And in recent time, he was even climbing just a few years ago up some incredible peaks that would frighten me. So Chris has been up to Everest twice. He's been there four times. He's climbed and summited it twice. He's climbed so many mountains around the world. And it was great to see a guy that just has such vigor and such passion. You know, he loves what he does and he's not afraid to keep pushing forward and doing it. And here at the age of 85, he's a great lesson to all of us, like all of us, that you can do anything you set your mind to and you're never too old to try. If you've enjoyed this episode, then click here and you'll be able to see other episodes of the podcast. But if you've really enjoyed it, then do me a favor and click over there and subscribe. If you press the bell button as well, you'll get notified every single time a new episode comes straight to YouTube. It will come straight to you. So why don't you do me a big favor and just click over there and subscribe and make sure you get more awesome podcasts just like this.